<clears throat> the, in order to explain a certain uh, feature based on uh, a number of other features, it might be difficult. So PCA allows us to uh, basically reduce the feature dimensions from higher dimensionality space into a lower dimensionality space. That means uh, we might lose some uh, inter-explanatory pa power, but in the end, we will have the ability to uh, predict a certain feature based on a few other features, usually a couple of uh, principal components that are extracted out of a larger uh, number of features. Great, thanks. And and again, people who, who haven't understood challenge here, this is a time like, you know, a very free discussion, right? So if you, I'm trying to ask a lot of people so that you get a different perspective and how they understand it. And I will also just, of course, chip in um, the, the, from the fact, but just ask also the question if you haven't understood, what is it that you haven't understood? That does it. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, basically, this uh, principal component analysis is just, uh, it is used most of the time to reduce or to avoid uh, multi-colonality. Uh, for example, when you have a predictor data on some data, from data set, if inside that pre uh, data, you may have uh, data which are uh, the predictive variables which are not valuable for you. So you can reduce that dimension uh, of data sets so that your, uh, your variability, variability can be explained using some fair variables rather than uh, describing the data using higher variables. For example, when you see uh, some thing uh, in your data, some original data. Uh, the, for example, the amount of when when I say the amount of uh, renting something, uh, people prefer to rent by small money. For example, so you may you may reduce that dimension and you can interpret it separately. So that's my understanding. Okay, great. So. In a way, it's of course, you know, uh, it's a type of, okay, Abel, just let's have finally Abel and then I will just go Abel. Okay. Uh, my understanding uh, of a PCA is uh, a PCA used uh, to eliminate the correlated variables uh, that doesn't contribute in any work or future process. May maybe some columns might have a very related or overfitting characteristics, but that doesn't mean it has some advantage for our future process or for our email future algorithm processes. And that's how hard and I understand about the PC. In short. Wonderful. Actually, that's really, that's it. In some really, really small, like very short summary, that's exactly what it does. Even the purpose of it is just to eliminate correlated variables but it doesn't mean you can you know it basically gives it it puts but yeah simply what it does is that it finds highly correlated things basically you can replace one with the other so you kind of merge them right so you will in some how it does it let's let's break it into two the actual meaning is exactly that it is in your high school mathematics you probably have learned some kind of linear dependence and if you prove that there is a linear dependence, you know, you can write it as a y is equal to a x plus b sub z, blah, blah, right? So that kind of way of writing. And it gives it a score. So which feature, which, like, so in terms of the, how it does it, it will basically rotate the coordinates. So if you just look at x, y, so I'm just going to share a screen. And I want you to unmute because when I share my screen, I probably won't be able to um see the screen so unmute and and ask right so usually that's what it is this is called coordinate system right now there is here x and there is here y now if you see this kind of thing 
that means they are correlated. It, it can be this way, it can be that way, it doesn't matter which way, negative, positive correlation. Let's imagine there is some type of correlation. And the best, it's of course, if it's like this linear, then it's easy. What do you need to do is that you can describe, instead of using two dimension, X and Y, what, do you, what, what you can describe is that you can rotate the coordinates, so by 45 degree, and then all of the points will lie in this new X or new rotated coordinate. So that's basically what it does. And then Y will not contribute. So you can ignore it because everything lies now in one dimension. So if it is, of course, purely correlated, that means a two correlation between the two will, will reduce to one dimension. But this new dimension is a new, it's not X, it's not Y, but we can call it PC, PC1 or principal component one. So what, you know, forget the math, whatever, what it really is trying to find is that it is finding correlated variables. And then if they are strongly correlated, that means the purpose of the other variable could go down. So, and then this can be done in any dimension and you can always, and then you call that a rotated coordinate as PC1, PC2, PC3, whatever. It's a new, and what, what is PC1 in this just simple example? It's it's because it's a linear one, it's AX plus B, and AY plus uh, BX, right? So that's basically uh, the new coordinate would be some kind of a linear combination between them. So basically you're trying to find a correlation axis such that you can rotate your, your coordinate system such that the points lie along only one dimension instead of two dimensions in this case, but in any dimension, it's a generalization of that. So for example here, right? So in this case, you know, you can have, you can reduce it into, by rotating different types of coordinate systems, you can always, or by, you know, like that, you can try to find different type of pieces. So if it is circular, so this is, for example, linear, but if the points were circular, then you will never reduce it to one dimension. So you still need, PC1 and PC2, which means exactly in that case, PC, PCA doesn't give you any advantage. So PCA only, as Abel said, only gives you an advantage to eliminate correlated systems because if they are highly correlated, then you, you can describe it with one, uh, with one information. So this is what it does. And all of that diagonalization, the first part is, you know, you are computing correlation metrics, you know, the big correlation matrix between different, um, um, between the different coordinates. So in this case, if you have, you know, 50 dimensions and if you want to compute it at, at the 50 dimension, you compute correlation at 50 by 50 correlation. Like that means um, uh, each of them you correlate them. And then on that, it's called diagonalization, but that diagonalization is kind of rotation in, 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 a, in a space. Usually it's called a diagonalization. But ultimately what you get is that principal components which are just your new X and Y, like your new X, Y, Z, you know, but these are just any other features which are called PC1, PC2, whatever. And then a value to them, it's called eigenvalue. And those values tells you how important they are. As I said now, if it is, if now let's assume you have only two dimension and if these two dimensions are highly correlated, so the first PC will be really big, like the value of it, the eigenvalue will be almost close to one because it's a very important, it's where all of, you know, that dimension alone will describe it better. The second dimension, in this case, for example, you know, like the, what I was showing you, like the second dimension, which is what you call PC2, you know, so this is PC2 and this is, uh, this is PC1 and this is PC2. The, the PC2 dimension doesn't have any information. Every, every point is lying along PC1. Therefore, the value of PC2 or the, its eigenvalue will be almost zero. So the eigenvalue will tell you how important is that, that actually, uh, that new dimension, right? So if this was circular, the very first original data was circular, then of course, both PC1 and PC2 will be equally important. That's why their eigenvalues would be 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, because there was no correlation. If there's no correlation, then it doesn't help you. That means you have to keep both of the coordinate system uh, to describe the data. That's what really say. So hopefully that that's kind of gives a, a certain understanding. But if you don't understand it, 
don't be, you know, just really now is the time. Just what is it bothering you? Like for anyone who hasn't understood, in, in, for example, Ken, what is your challenge in understanding? And also I have seen uh, a few people. So ask it so that, you know, we, as I said always, when you ask, you are not only helping yourself, you are helping other people. It's, it's really a favor to the community. Is everything clear what we said? So that's what you could you could see, you know, it's, uh, this, uh, these ones are like visualizations. So you can actually just play with it uh, for visual understanding. But I think there are many, I think, uh, is that somebody also, CDO, probably shared also some YouTube references, but I think these are much more of like very simple concepts, but sometimes it's um, having why are we using it? It's important to have it. So every time you read something, it's so many people explain it differently, but I think the really one thing you have to know is that it's just the high school mathematics that they have learned or a university, I don't know where, you have to prove linear dependence if they are linearly dependent, then you can write them in, in terms of like some equation, right? So that kind of thing, um, great. Awesome, great. So if there are no questions, we can also go to the... Um, so that's exactly, so uh, Amal, good question. Where do we use it? Where do we use it? Usually we use PCA so that we try to check, I think, again, taking exactly what Abel said, taking if, do we need 50 of the dimensions? You know, we, we have 50 whatever dimensions. Do we need 50 of the dimensions? Or can we reduce it to a smaller number without losing information? And the PCA will help you to understand by looking at the, you know, the PCAs and then their eigenvalues, basically, you can drop any of the eigenvalues that are smaller and you can keep, of course, interpretation wise. Now, this is a linear combination, so it's a slightly different. It's not the same as, you know, YouTube upload, YouTube download speed, whatever type of dimension where it has a very clear star meaning, but it would give you a linear combination of different ones as, a, as PCs. And then, but it reduces the dimension, let's say from 50, maybe the most important dimensions are you know, it's, uh, let's say 10 in this case. So it will help you in the pipeline to reduce your dimension and to be able to, especially for clustering and other information, and to also know how much of the informations are important. Like, is, 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 is this data really dependent on, on the 50 dimensions or are these columns correlated to each other that you can actually merge them into some uh, PCS? Is that clear, Aman? It's much more to reduce the dimensions. Great, Biniam. Okay, <clears throat> I have one question. Yeah. Uh, when we use the PCA, yeah, uh, and uh, reduce it to a few number of features or uh, yeah, components, features. yeah, PCs or features, yeah. Okay, uh, do we specify the number or? No, you, you don't. Actually, PCA computes exactly the same number. If you have 50 dimensions, then it will give you 50 PCs. Now, you will choose which ones to keep. Usually, you choose which one to keep. PCs, like it gives you the principal components as well as their eigenvalue. Their eigenvalue mean call it a score for each of them, how relevant they are, okay? And then usually you, you say anything below 0 0.1, I probably can live with. Basically by 0 0.1, it means it contributes only 0 0.1 information or like, you know, one person, let's say 0 0.01. In that case, it's, it's only uh, relevant that it only contributes 1% of the information. So that means you can, you know, all the rest, so you can plot, for example, as you increase the, the PC, the information content. So actually, if you're using it, 
uh, in scikit, you can actually plot as a function of the number of PCs or the number of dimensions, the number of PCA principal components, the information contents. So that information content, as you can see, of course, if you use 50 of the PCs, it means 100% information. But most of them, probably the remain the last, you know, 20, 30, maybe only contributes 1% of the information. While the first four might contribute, let's say, 90% of the information. In that case, you know, by losing only small, you can reduce the dimension to a fewer. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you very much. Mm. So let's say we selected a couple of uh, uh, the features or the PCA features yeah. that uh, probably contribute like 75% of the prediction uh, ability. So what's next? Uh, it's yeah. my understanding that uh, <clears throat> we first need to classify the variables yeah. into a predictor in the uh, uh, target. I think so. In the end, we are testing uh, the PCA features. How well they predict the target? Is that yeah? The... Yeah. So, so for the current project, what you really are using PCs are to reduce dimensions so that you can speed up your like your. Um, but also, you can always from one PC, you can always go and look from because it's you know as I said, it's a linear combination. So you can always go back and, okay, let's imagine the first PC or PC1. So PC1 may be contributing 40% of the information. Now you can go and look at like which, which original features contributed here. You can also go back and relate it. You know, what is it, you know, what makes PC, this PC an important one? So you, from interpretation perspective, you can go. But the most important part is that now given the original data and this data are similar, the information is similar. Now you're going to do your analysis and modeling and clustering at smaller dimensions. That means you it will speed up your modeling, right? So it is about that at the moment. It's about speeding up your computation. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. So, okay, Amal, uh, I mean, we don't know a priori, first whether it's collinear or not how do we know if it is you know the the pcs are helping or pc analysis is helping if it is if as i said earlier there are fewer pcs like let's say you start from 50 dimensions originally now you have of course 50 pcs of course always but let's imagine the 10 pcs contain 90 percent of the information in that case you say like oh great it, the data really was could have been reduced. It's like zipping, you know? If you have a CSV and you zip it, usually you know, like a one gigabyte CSV can be zipped into very, very small, right? But of course, the zipped information, sometimes you don't use it, but it's nice for, trans, you know, for doing so many other things. Like for example, for sending it to people. It's like the same, uh, a priori, we're, we really are kind of don't know, but, by looking at the, the values, the values of the eigenvalues, we'll be able to know if the data was kind of benefited from, from PC analysis. Because if if the you know if we the P, if the information is not contained in few PCAs, but you know, most still there is no one single PCA that contains a lot of information, then PCA doesn't help you. That basically means also the data is not you know, the data is not highly correlated or the features are not correlated. So you have to use basically the original data. So you have to probably find another algorithm to help you. Okay. So another algorithm, a very similar algorithm, PCA is for uh, principal component analysis is a linear correlation. It only looks at linear correlation. There is another one, which is, which takes into account the nonlinear one. That is usually autoencoder in deep learning. So you autoencoder in deep learning does a very similar thing. It compresses your original data into fewer sets, fewer features um, using basically neural networks. So you may now go like, maybe, okay, there's no linear correlation, but there might be nonlinear correlation and you might want to get that one using autoencoder. So yeah, I don't know if I answer Amal your question. 
So, but yes, PCA will only help when there is a linear correlation. Is that, does that address your question, Amma? Yeah, I mean, you choose. It is not that PCA will tell you, oh, that. PCA will just give you, from 50 dimensions, it will give you 50 PCAs. And for each of the PCAs, it gives you the eigenvalue, which is another way to call it is a score. How relevant each of them are. And if the scores for all of them are, you know, equivalent, then that means PCA doesn't help. Great, Martin. Thank you for the opportunity. I also wanted to ask about uh, the things and uh, that that aspect of dimensionality reduction. I heard you speaking about it. Uh, I wanted uh, whether you could uh, further explain on how whether you can actually also use k-means for the reduction, like the dimension dimensionality reduction, absolutely. just the way we use PCA. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you see, in general, what we are saying earlier, uh, what I was saying is that. You had 100 rows, and each of them, the 100 rows, can be considered in their n dimension. So whenever we think of columns, columns are dimensions, right? So if you have 50 features, you can think of it that you are now working on 50 dimensions. That means one data point is a single point in this 50 dimension. That means one row is a point, like, so x, y, z is a three dimension and a point, a coordinate system, like, you know, in that one is called one row. The same, any data, you know, an image, let's take an image, a picture of a, a dog. Uh, the pixel size of the picture is, let's imagine it is 16 pixel by 16 pixel. Now, this data, you can represent it in principle, every, like the, how many pixels are there? 16 by 16, 256 pixel. Now, a single picture can be put as a single point in, if you assume there are 256 dimensions, that means at each dimension represents now a pixel. Now, in this, the value of the pixel, each of them, each of the pixel have one value. And then it's basically, if you put this picture, one dog picture, this basically becomes a point in the 256 dimension, right? So, now, different types of pictures, like 100 pictures, becomes 100 points in this dimension, okay? So that's the, all, the way to think about data. If it is now a huge, huge data, a huge feature, like let's imagine um, a data which is represented by, you know, like an image which has uh, uh, 5 megapixel, right? So that means 5 million pixel. Now, of course, if every of these images that are coming can be put in this 5 million dimension. So that's why it's kind of, you should always think of it as like columns to be, or pixels to be just dimensions. Now rows are recurves, right? So each row is basically individual recurves. That means single points in this n dimension. Now, each of these points can be, you can assume them to be a cluster on their own, but you could also reduce it the data into a fewer subset. What is a fewer subset in this case? You basically cluster them and you call the center of the cluster to be, to be one. So in this case, you are still compressing, but compressing the rows. K-means compresses your row. PCA compresses not the row, but it compresses the columns, the dimension. So, but both of them are just type of compression. Like ultimately, if you represent it that way, then you, the data is compressed. Okay, but every compression, as you might know, also loses information. It's about how much are you losing information. But like PCA, if you start from 50 dimensions and you end up in 50 dimensions, of course, that is called lossless. That means it doesn't, it, you haven't compressed it still, you know, it's the same, and, but it's lossless. Only when you throw the, the, the PCAs that doesn't contribute much that you start losing information. I hope that explains. Uh, of course, it's usually easier if, you know, someone is showing something, a uh, presentation that's easier, but does the explanation make sense? 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's it's quite good. <coughs> awesome. Okay, great. So, um, any other question? Now, PCA, hopefully people are clear. If not, you can ask, of course, in Slack, whatever. But any other statistical question that you were struggling, you could, in principle, you could also just want to present a case and say, like, how, how would I do this? So that's also, you know, let's just feel free. I just want to increase the statistical awareness here. Any, anyone has any questions, statistical or anything related question? So, what I'm going to do now, if not, is last time I was about to present the um, probabilistic thinking. And I will probably now go through run fast on probabilistic thinking. Okay? Do you see my screen? Do you see my screen? Anyone? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, again, ask me. I am very much like I don't, I mean, uh, my style is usually just participatory. That means I can only, if I talk a lot, you will not understand much. If you ask me, you will understand better. Okay. So in, in what I wanted to actually, it, this is much more of like a very basic statistics. I mean, not statistics, but how, how would you, the mindset for understanding statistics, okay. Or anything related to this inference. So. I mean, I will share this one. Um, these are kind of uh, things that uh, slightly a little bit involved with the statistics uh, or probability thinking. But I will start with a way of like asking you a question. Let's imagine you start, you, um, you know, a jar has a five red balls and seven blue balls. Okay. Now, suppose that you draw at the first round. And then you were, you know, you were not told the outcome. So whether it was red, the, the draw, or blue, you were, you know, you were not told. But then now a second draw was performed without knowing the first draw, the result of the first draw. And now the question is, does the probability of the first draw being red or blue change with the knowledge of the second? So now let's imagine the second, the, the outcome of the second draw was Right. Now you were told what is the probability of the first draw? Does it change knowing the second draw? Does it change your first your kind of estimation of the probability of the first draw being red or blue? Um, somebody must read for me because I am unable to switch. If anyone has. If even you don't understand the question, you can tell me. Any, anyone? Is it clear, the question? Participatory means online. You have to give indication to the person. Yeah, I guess. Uh... The the if we know the second one the the first prediction probably we can guess something that is whether blue or red I guess I'm not sure so so you think no you don't have to be sure so <laughs> can can you think of a very quick kind of illustration example where this becomes really true like like think of a scenario now I gave you one scenario called five red and seven blue. But think of a scenario where knowing the second draw influences the, the probability calculation of the first draw. Time series data, I guess. No, no, I'm just even think of it right here. Almost always, you know, what I'm trying to instill in you is how to transform. Don't get it. This is kind of brain teaser. 
to solve a brain teaser, usually you don't subscribe to the, the original questions uh, rules. You have to create your own rule to answer it. Okay, That's maybe it. can I continue? Yeah, go on. Okay, yeah. For this, for this, I don't think knowing the second one is read may affect the the first the first outcome. But had it been, for example, like one red balls and maybe seven blue balls, uh, if the second uh, draw was red, undoubtedly the first one will be blue. So it may affect. But Absolutely. since the number of red, uh, red no, no, balls, no, 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 you don't need to re-look at five and seven. I think in statistics, that's that's exactly. Now you get confused if you just look at the, this one. You basically say it answered the question by rotating it to say, okay, had I had one rate and had it been the second row was red, I know for sure the first row would be blue. And that means definitely, yes, the second row, knowing the second row, that's it. This knowing the second row draw would would change the probability of the first row. That's it. That's how you need to think. It's one special case that ability to make it like that would allow you to answer the question fully. Because the question is exactly what is asked. It's not about giving me the calculation. No. What is asked is that does the probability of you know the does knowing the second row does it change? your calculation of the, first, you know, the probability of the, the first row? And the answer is yes. And why? Because exactly you just said, if I had one red and seven blue, and if the second row was red, I knew in the first row, definitely the probability would be one. But if I know now the second row is blue, then the probability of being red is one over, you know, one over uh, something, right? So it's definitely the calculation has changed. So great, you answered the question. And that's what I wanted. And thinking is like, in probability, it's like that. It's not about, if you complex, if you make it complex, you don't answer it. It is about seeing one very good way to look at it and find one, you know, clear clarity is important. Does that, does that satisfy everyone? Yes, yes, very much. Great. Sorry, I have a question. Yes, go on. What if it's with uh, without replacement? Would it that's it, that's right? beautiful question. Exactly. If it was with replacement, then the the statement will not be true. But that's exactly the rule of the thing. This is without replacement. Okay. But okay. absolutely, exactly a statistical way of thinking. Another one. The procedure is also important. The procedure of doing it is important. That's why sometimes, even when when you are doing. You know, you, you will come over and over, under sampling, over sampling. It's called also bootstrapping. Bootstrapping means exactly this kind of replacement. And then you, you have also CVs. CVs are like this uh, cross validation. And cross validation you can have sometimes with, you know, and bootstraps, for example, for uh, boosting algorithms, you might use bootstrap samples. Bootstrap samples are samples that are created with replacement. They are different from CVs that are actually happen like that. So it's absolutely the procedure is important. And this exactly this understanding has a huge implication. What it means is that it is statistics is not temporal, it's logical. That means it even it, it like the information is not temporal. That temporal means time dependence. That means you know if if something happened before um, in a normal temporal things, like for example, you know, human, like if you have eaten your cake, you can't get it, right? You can't influence. Now having anything um, that you do after that doesn't influence the, that you ate the cake, you know, you already ate the cake. So everything in human things, it's temporal. Probability is not temporal. Probability is what we call it uh, logical. That means it only is dependent on logic not time per se okay so it has a huge deep implication in statistics so that's why i want to bring it here and the same thing is also like now whoever said whoever asked me about this replacement the procedure is also important whether this was drawn with replacement or without replacement 
And so this is without replacement. Otherwise, if it was with replacement, the, the question would change totally. Great. Can I pass? The next one, right? So now, what are we doing? What are we doing? Even the, the whole question that you are doing now is that you have collected data. It's a telecommunication data. There are a lot of people. It was collected. But the question, the business question is so different. The business question is, should I invest or not? Should I invest in this company? What does that mean when the question is, should I invest in this company? Because what you collected is not about, you know, like the usual uh, machine learning thing. You know, you didn't collect, oh, somebody bought this and then they got profit. Somebody bought that, they got profit or they lost. You didn't collect that kind of data, right? What you collected in, on the other hand is how the company, you know, the users, it's kind of like whether how they use the, the company, you know, the, this telecommunication, whether they're satisfied, whatever, or even some of them. So, but then you're trying to answer somebody completely a different question. Should I invest? What does, what connects the question of should I invest to the data that is absolutely different, that is kind of related to about, you know, how many people, how many, uh, megabytes, you know, did they use, whether, you know, like in a call, how long they remained, what connects them? Can someone answer, just, you know, give their reflection? You know, how are they connected? What do, what is the thing that connects them, the question in the data? The data shows that uh, how many people are using it, uh, if certain application, how much megabytes are using it. In terms of more usage means more money, I guess. Great, that's a good start. Yeah, so there is a certain connection. Go on, I, I can't see, so please um, go on. Like, when you raise your hand, just go on, just speak up. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now, yes. <clears throat> okay. The data shows uh, the behavior of the users and uh, the connection is uh, how does this behavior relate to uh, their uh, continued engagement with that specific company? Because it spends, if they keep on uh, using uh, the service of that company, it means that company can, can continue being profitable. Exactly. Great. So that means it is this relationship that, as you just said, cause and effect. That means behavior, a good behavior would lead. But these things are not, these things are part of our connections, right? Part of our study. We must, it's called causal. So there will be one project where you will do causal analysis. But what is really is saying exactly as you, as you just both said, is that you are assuming the profit, which is the question, or like whether it's profitable or not, is dependent, has causes. Is it, does it have only one cause or multiple causes? It's multiple. Right? Because yes, the satisfaction is one, but service is one. And uh, consumer behavior is one, like that means like, do they need it? Demand is one. So there are a number of them. So that is what it's kind of in this, like in, when we look at a way of understanding, when we're relating between a question and the data, a data is an observation, right? And whenever there is, so there are two ways of looking at this. Whenever we think there is one cause, and then from that cause, you have multiple data, the same as what, what you are actually saying. Um, like, you know, like mathematics is like that. You have one theorem and from that theorem, you have multiple uh, outcomes, right? Multiple kind of proofs or multiple uh, lemmas. In that actually kind of ways, what you have is, this is called deductive reasoning. 
you're basically saying there's a cause and there's multiple outcomes. So it's kind of you are, you're going to solve, you have the cause, you want to now find out the possible outcomes, count it. So that's called mathematics. Statistics, on the other hand, is the, the exact opposite. You don't know the possible causes because the possible causes for profit are, as we said, a number of things like that there is demand, that the service is good, plus the policy is also allowing it, and plus maybe the technology is ready, plus people are, are able to afford, blah, blah, right? There are so many of these causes. What you have observation is to infer about them. For example, how many times did they call? How, how much did they watch? You know, did they, do they have Netflix, whatever, that would consume a number of uh, kind of a huge data, like kind of data, that means because they are video and this and that. So that's what you have. Now you're trying to infer from them exactly the question we give you is to infer that whether they, the observations you have, they relate to the cause. So the cause in this case is, is there demand? Is there kind of the, uh, the company in this case who's serving has the potential, like the, can it satisfy the demand? Are people happy with the demand? You know, and do they have the, do the people can afford it? Do they have the equipment to do it? So these are basically the red balls, what you're kind of seeing here are these different causes. And these are the data that you have exactly just the 50 whatever columns you have. And you're trying to see if there is proof of that. That is called inductive reasoning, okay? And then from that inductive reasoning, you know, this is also in itself, these different possible causes are also related to profitability. Profitability means another one is another similar possible causes for this one. So that is how statistics is. Statistics is trying to infer an unknown from observations to unknown, these are called hidden variables usually, uh, when latent variables. You can have latent variables or probably they are the, Exactly, if they are just the target variables that you are interested to infer, for example, in classification, you have images and you want to classify if it's dog or cat. So the dog and cat basically is just now in this case, the target variable. So this could be just the, you know, the target variable. But on the other hand, for the current project, these are basically the call times, blah, blah, blah. These are probably uh, experience, satisfaction, whatever. And then profitabilities. So these basically are latent variables. And then they are related back to the profitability with other relationship, right? So that's called, in that case, if they are in the middle, they are called latent variables um, or hidden variables. So in a way, statistics allows you to infer, to go through this kind of ways, okay? I am, I'm just gonna skip. But one of the most important question is, what is probability? And how do we assign probability to something? Right? So I think I will stop with this and we'll continue this over time because I don't want to overload is that when you think of probability, you must think of it as two things. One is a syntax. The other one is a semantics. So the syntax of a probability, which means the mathematics, you can write probability of, you know, uh, someone like engagement to be high or high engagement is you can calculate it, that's, you can write equation. So these are syntax is mathematics. And as I said earlier, mathematics doesn't change. Mathematics is very truthful, no uncertainty in it. It's how you define it. So the mathematics of probability, which is called the syntax, the manipulation of probability is very much defined by what is called Kolmogorov axioms. And this is just nothing uncertain about it. This is mathematics fully. The interpretation of probability, that's what sometimes what we really are talking about, you know, because there are multiple ways of interpreting the same variable X. X can be a human, X can be, you know, a quantity, X like that. The interpretation of it is actually what we sometimes call, there are two types of major uh, interpretation. One is the frequentist and another one is called Bayesian. And the, these are changing. And they are the most important parts of probability sometimes that, or what makes probability hard is the semantics part. But you must know the syntax, 
how you manipulate probability once you define what is a random variable, what is a probability distribution. Once you define that, its evolution is basically how you compute from one state to another. It's, it's kind of defined by mathematics. So there is nothing different about it, whether it's probability, you know, Bayesian, frequentist, whatever, it will be identical. Okay. So, and in that sense, the syntax of probability is defined only by these very few rules, nothing more. All, only these four or five axioms just define all form of computation in probability. Everything you know, everything that exists about probability are defined by this simple way of axioms. And the axioms are probability of X when whenever we write probability of X, X being a random variable, probability of X means always we must assume that this the probability of this with respect to certain background information. That background information is with respect to the word, you know, what is the probability of a height uh, of uh, a man in a, in, a, in a grade three school or in a grade three uh, class? Basically, it's, we assume ah, it's within the background information could be that, you know, that uh, everything you know about it. That means the school's grade three students are probably age something, you know, age probably, let's say, between uh, nine and 11. Um, and they are usually uh, which country that you are asking this question, blah, blah. These are all, even if they are not specified, they are called background information. And you must state what your background information is. Otherwise, imagine if you ask that question in Ethiopia, in Kenya, in Germany, or in, in Netherlands, you might get a very different result without specifying the background information. So the background information, even if it may not be written, it's actually specified. And the probability of, for example, another one is the probability of all events except X. So the complement of that is written like that. And the probability sums are probability of X or Y. For example, that the probability that it is uh, uh, tomorrow, it's a, a, a temperature uh, above, below three degree or above, you know, 20 degree. So that kind of things would be, is defined again by this notation. And then the end product or the, 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 the end one is that the probability of like tomorrow will be rain plus end that there will be, you know, a demonstration. So that's kind of the kind of question. And then the conditional probability, probability of, you know, tomorrow raining given that uh, it is summer. Like that's, for example, the kind of like conditioned on something. And once you know how to manipulate that, this is how manipulations work, how you manipulate that, that's it. You have defined probability and everything you must adhere to this. So the computation of any complex probability, whatever you have seen over your lifetime has been computed using these just rules. Like, so that's it. There's the, the, the sum rule, the product rule, the normalization rule, and the marginalization rule. That's it. And without, with, the, with that, you basically reproduce every statistics that ever has been written uh, in the world. Okay. So that is the rules, the syntax. Of course, you know, I will, I will follow on the um, kind of the interpretation of it, but the interpretation is basically whether for example, when you look at now the, um, your, your plotting, when you are looking at the histogram, what you're really asking is that how is, for example, the call time distributed over like, let's imagine the measure. So each people are talking and different people, of course, talk for different times. Now you might ask, how are they distributed? That's why you plot usually histograms. But then you might say like, what is, like if I want to model it, not for the type of sample that I have, which is, let's say I have 60,000 sample, but instead for the general, how are call times within the company, within the information, the background information distributed, then you have to search, you have to fit a type of distribution function such that, you know, you know, with that, you can make a statement. So statements or generalization is usually, is it Gaussian? Because if it's Gaussian, that means, okay, you know, the process that generates this thing is Gaussian, which means, okay, people usually like, if you take N number of people, 
most of them will talk the number of times that's basically just the median or the mean. And then there are other people, of course, who talk smaller than that or longer than that. But the number of people who do that, you know, who differ from the mean are equal. That means random, like it's just a random uh, thing. But if it's not, if it's not Gaussian, on the other hand, if it is uh, exponential distribution, then you say, oh, most people will talk, of course, one time, but the rest will just follow a certain distribution. That's called interpretation. Like you're now looking at and you're trying to infer the behavior of people based on basically distributions. Exactly like that. So I think we'll continue, but hopefully if you have any question, you, know, you can ask around here, but this is much more of to start guiding your intuition and it's not overnight, you will understand all of it. It's just that hopefully you have got a little bit of, you know, kind of understanding what you're doing. You know, how are they related? How's the business questions are related and all that. Jonas, go on. Uh, can we have some reference like, if, if we want to read more about it? Like, sure, the, the I, I will share this slide uh, and the references. Stuff. I would share this, the slides and references so that you are able, as I said, you don't have time that much to really, you know, these things are, I know, I know it would be so amazing if we just all understand it, right? But you will get there. But the, the strategy is that just learn bits and pieces now and there, ask questions and, and that, but you may not have time to really deeply understand, you know, the elements of this. But over time, I guarantee you, you'll start getting familiar with it because whenever you see more and more and more and more of the same thing, that means there is business question, there is data, you have to relate it and then you have to interpret it. Then the repetition of it, it's like language, you know, you, you, you get it, you forget it, you get it, you forget it. But if you repeat it, you learn it. So many things are like that in life. So it's about dealing with your own even curiosity sometimes is a hard thing. Like that means you want to know everything, but you don't have time. You know, that's a reality. But I will share that. But I will say, don't waste too much time in that. Instead, ask it. Use the community so that you get enriched um, and that it's also recorded so that you can refer it back. Because whatever I said, you will forget it tomorrow. And then you have to read it again. Especially statistics is really not easy because it's not our, our brain doesn't work in statistics. You know, that's what's, that's why, um, it has been proved again and again, our, our brain is not really suitable for statistics. So our default way of thinking for statistics is not good. So it's just a matter of getting used to just like that. You will get used to thinking about thousand dimensions, even if all that, you know, in reality is three dimensions, but just by, you know, by just renaming dimensions to be features and understanding features and then kind of extending that thought into dimensions and getting used to the interchangeably using dimension and features you start getting used to everything so sometimes deal with of course you know i know that it's it's it may not be but dealing with your own even wanting to know everything at certain time uh, is also a challenge so know that but i will share definitely but keep questions and um, yeah, like kind of let's just brainstorm over time. I'm, I'm happy to go through some of these, you know, the slides and get whenever it's necessary to talk about the distributions, random variables, things like that, that might help um, over time. Okay. Awesome. I think in, in light of time, I will stop there unless there is um, burning question. Awesome. Great guys. And thank you. So we, uh, Anastasia, we can uh, stop the recording and we'll do like this, you know, like in, in an informal way, just more often, um, at least once in a week like that, but not only on this, but on general other things, including, you know, the concept of programming and the, the, some other concepts that are required like for you know a broader understanding a general picture thanks all bye so uh, i 
I think Anastasia, are you there to close it? So, Ten Academy team, can you help to close the recording? <laughs> 